Okay, welcome back biologists. Uh, we're moving into our next module, our next unit, which is basically energy enzymes and thermodynamics. And this is one of our more challenging sets of content. And so um, the way that I often talk about this or try and teach this is with a set of Socratic, pretty leading questions um, that when you formulate the answers to, you systematically build up some understanding where at the end is what I hope you have is one of these, oh, now I get it, or now I understand it, it makes sense kind of moments, an epiphany, if you if you will. Um, so I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And the way that I'm going to do this is I will ask the question uh, on, the on the screen, and then I will uh, briefly discuss the question. And so you probably want to pause the video just after the question comes up and I make a short pause. That way you can look at the question, consider it and formulate an answer in your mind. And it's really important you do that. Okay, so let's get going. What is the first thing to deal with? The first thing to deal with is this idea that covalent bonds contain chemical potential energy. And so what's going to happen in our next module is we're going to look at cellular respiration and then we'll get into photosynthesis. So the whole kind of foundational principle that, that cellular respiration and photosynthesis is built on is the transformation of energy and matter. And this is one of these unifying, overarching principles that, that helps you understand biology. Biological systems must transform energy and matter, and they must do the energy transformation um, so that cells can do work, because doing work means that you're alive. Um, so. Covalent bonds contain chemical potential energy. How do we transfer that, transform that chemical potential energy into other forms of chemical potential energy? And we'll talk about ATP when we talk about cellular respiration, which can then be transformed into other forms of chemical potential, other forms of, of, of energy that can do work. That could be kinetic energy, that kind of thing. And in some organisms, uh, the production of heat energy is also uh, biologically important. So. Let's start off by just flipping back in our minds and thinking about covalent bonds. So give this question a try. I won't discuss this one. Uh, I'll put the answer up in a moment. Okay, so hopefully uh, you are on board with the idea that a covalent bond is a bond that forms when two atoms share electrons, and we can talk about a pair of electrons, we talk about four electrons, or we talk about six electrons being shared, because each covalent bond contains two electrons. So let's start with these kind of leading questions. Um, I hope you like my candle with the water flame burning there, it's, uh, it'll make a little sense in a moment. Okay, let's start off with this. Which of these two molecules burns? Water or gasoline? It's a leading question, obviously, so you know the answer to that. Um, clearly, gasoline burns better than water. Um, even the worst of cooks would have a hard time burning water on their stove. But gasoline, if you add a little bit of energy in the form of a flame or a spark, you'll get a very rapid burning process, which releases a large amount of chemical, a large amount of uh, heat energy and light energy during the energy and amount of transformations that occur there. Okay, so how about these two? Again, pretty easy. What about these two molecules uh, or groups of molecules? Which one burns better? Okay, again, pretty, pretty obvious. Um, nobody ever burned water, but fat and glucose burn pretty well. Um, if you put fan, fat in a pan and you, you heat it up and you heat it up and you heat it up, it will eventually catch fire if you can get enough heat engine into it and you will have a transformation of, of energy and of matter. And glucose does the same. You can, you can light um, uh, glucose uh, on fire pretty easily. So um, fat and glucose burn much better than, than do water. So let's now think about the types of molecules that we have, the types of bonds that we have in those different types of molecules. So let's think about water. What kind of covalent bonds do you find in water molecules? Again, that's pretty easy. We, we, we talked about this several weeks ago now. Um, we have an electronegative oxygen, an electropositive hydrogen, so the oxygen is pulling the electrons toward it. There's a greater probability the electrons will be found close to the oxygen, so that means the oxygen has a slight negative partial charge, and, um, and so that means we end up with a 
or with a, um, a polar covalent bond. So in water that does not burn, we have polar covalent bonds. Now, what about fat molecules? Think back to our discussion of fat. Um, fats, um, you remember making carbon and hydrogen. So think about the kinds of bonds you find in fat molecules. Okay, so there we've got carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogen bonds. So let's just do carbon hydrogen to start with. Um, relatively similar electronegativity, so the electrons are distributed on a probability basis relatively evenly in the bond, uh, just as close to the to the hydrogen as they are to be close to the carbon. So that means we end up with a polar, uh, sorry, the non-polar covalent bond, and the same is true in a carbon-carbon bond. So when we think about fat molecules, then we see um, we see a lot of non-polar covalent bonds. So now we've got the situation where water, polar bonds, doesn't burn. It means it doesn't contain much energy. Then we've got fats, polar bond, non-polar bonds, burns well, contains a lot of energy. Okay, so now let's think about which of these two has has more non-polar covalent bonds, water or glucose. So you, you can look up a molecule, look up a Google a molecule of glucose if you need to, take a look at that, and then see which has more non-polar covalent bonds. Okay, so let's start with water. You know the structure of that. You know that the bonds in water are polar. So there are no non-polar bonds in water. And if you look at glucose, there's a lot of carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, as well as some polar covalent bonds. But in glucose, there are some non-polar covalent bonds. And so those bonds contain a lot more energy than do the polar covalent bonds. So is what we're starting to build up here is the idea that when you have a molecule which has polar bonds, it doesn't contain much energy. When you have a molecule that contains some, up to many, or all non-polar covalent bonds, then you have a molecule with a lot of energy. So, is what we've reached is really the answer to this question, which is probably the most important question that I'm trying to get at here. Which kind of covalent bond contains more energy, polar or non-polar? Okay, so hopefully you've made some small steps here, and you've worked out that non-polar covalent bonds, and therefore the molecules that contain them, contain more energy than polar bonds and the molecules that contain that kind of bond. So this makes sense if you always go back to your understanding that water does not burn and water contains polar covalent bonds. Compare that to your knowledge that Fat burns well, and it contains a lot of non-polar covalent bonds. You can then work through the reasoning so that you understand that it's the non-polar covalent bonds in molecules which contain the energy which processes like cellular respiration have to liberate so that we can then start making molecules like ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. So just to summarize that, we can have a little diagram. So a carbon-carbon bond, okay, totally non-polar, carbon-hydrogen bond, also non-polar, have more energy, that little sign in the middle means greater than, has greater energy than a polar covalent bond, such as the one you'd find between an O and an H. So hopefully is what you've done is work through a number of steps and you can have this little device to help you remember that. So, uh, is what I want you to do is um, take a look at this diagram and pause the video in a moment and indicate the bonds in this molecule, this is glucose, in this molecule that contain the most energy. Okay, so hopefully what you did there was identify any bond which is non-polar. So, for example, this carbon-hydrogen bond here would contain more energy than the OH bond here. And this carbon-hydrogen bond, or this carbon-carbon bond, would contain more energy than this OH bond here because this carbon-hydrogen and carbon-carbon bond is non-polar, whereas the OH bond down here, the bond between the O and the H down here, is polar. Okay, so try this molecule then. Which of the bonds here store the most chemical potential energy?
Okay, so hopefully again is what you indicated are the carbon-carbon bonds, which are these ones. And then uh, the chemical diagram here is a little bit unusual. You may have not seen this before. Remember that carbon has a valence of four, makes four covalent bonds. That means at this point there's a carbon, this point there's a carbon, this point there's a carbon. So each of these carbons, because there's only one bond made here and one bond made here, there must be two additional bonds. And the chemist here is just not showing that there's a hydrogen down here and a hydrogen up here. And so any of these bonds that come off of these carbons that go to hydrogens would contain more energy than, for example, this carbon double bonded to this O or this OH bond that we see down here. Okay, so hopefully you can now look at some molecules and determine which bonds contain the most energy. And so the whole point of this that we're going to get to when we talk about cellular respiration is how does your body take, or how do your cells take the molecules that you find in this, for example, very tasty English roast dinner, and extract the energy that's in the molecules in that food, and use that energy to make the molecule ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. Okay, so all we've done here is we've, we've gone through a series of pretty simple questions to get you to the point of understanding that, um, I guess, or knowing that, that um, polar covalent bonds don't contain much energy and that um, non-polar covalent bonds do. And as long as you can recognize those bonds based on your understanding of different electronegativities of atoms, you can identify whether a molecule contains a lot of chemical potential energy or not much. Okay, that's it for now, and I'll see you next time.